then each channel has a reverb control too. Okay. Check one two. Yeah. Change some of those. Check. Stick the end in there. So the audience cool. knows about these paintings. Thanks. This should be. Oh, you can check talk one two one two. There's any viewers who are painted on this spot. These paintings were painted. Do 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 Hi, game. Sir?
told you to quit then. <laughs> oh, a heavy question. <coughs> <laughs> Are you still there? Hello. Hello. <clears throat> we are the mirror, as well as the face in it. We are tasting the taste this minute of eternity. We are pain and what cures pain. We are the sweet cold water and the jar that pours. A shout comes from the room where I've been cooped up. After the lust and dead living, 
I can live with you. You want me to. You fix and bring me food. You forget the way I have been. The ocean surges in the heat in the middle of the day, in the heat of this thought I'm having. Why aren't all human resistances burning up with this thought? It's a drum, and arms waving. It's a bonfire at midnight on the top edge of the hill, this meeting again with you. Surely I could tell When I sleep tonight A dream will call And raise its head In majesty Dividing all my energy To the meeting of your love Where from whence it came like a singer searching for a song, I tried to reach where you belong. Yes, I will be the one for you. I will be your servant child. No, oh no, I cannot be deceived. No, oh no. There's something that I feel, something that I feel inside. Surely I could tell when you ask me, Lord, to board the train. My life, my love, could be the same. Yes, I will be the one for you. In the meeting of your love, in the meeting of your Sufi poet who lived in the 12th century, and uh, his, uh, he's considered one of the most prolific poets in history with over some in the neighborhood of 10,000 poems to his 20, credit, 20,000? 20,000 poems to his credit, and uh, just a fraction of those have come to us via translations from Robert Bly and Coleman Barks, and uh, a lot of fun, um, some great books out there with the words of Rumi.
6 a.m. to be exact. I got this chair that I like to sit down in. I got a good book to read and get my day started in the right way. I got these two little girls, Tiffany and Janelle, to call them in the morning. I say, girls, get up. Yeah, it's time for school. They put on the clothes. Sugar too. Then I come on, baby, baby. I said, baby, get up, get up. It's time to get yourself together. Such a beautiful day outside. Simple pleasures are the best. Do 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 about and as we're sitting here in the spring we think about the future I think a lot in the spring and this is a harvest song from Africa um, a song of celebration and a song of getting together and sharing and the joys of the world we have around us My
It was there, I heard it. Harmony in the background. This one you can definitely sing along, okay? I'm gonna lay down my heavy load Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I'm gonna lay down my heavy load Down by study war no more. I ain't gonna 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 study war no more. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, down, down by the riverside, down, down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, and I ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna walk in a peaceful way down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down, down by the riverside. I'm gonna walk in a peaceful way down by the riverside and study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study. Down by the riverside, down, down by the riverside, down, down by the riverside. I'm on a lay down my sword and shield, down by the riverside. I ain't gonna study. Well, it's my pleasure to end the musical portion of 24 hours of readings and songs. And uh, I want to sing one more song to conclude. And, uh, it's a song about a guy named Fred. Oh, yes, yes. And it uh, has a lot to say about why we're here and just give you something to think about as we continue on through the final hours of our the great program. Thanks, Timmy. You're welcome. Fred jumped out of bed in the morning. He made his way out into the day. What would it bring? What would it bring? He feels the earth underneath his feet. He feels a pulse moving him from sleep. Moving him from sleep. Coming from the deep, he takes a breath and sings. 
Hola, 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 I am thankful for this day. Oh, earth, oh, man, may we move together in a peaceful way. Peaceful way. Fred ran on down through the valley to the spring glistening to wash the night away for the coming new day. There he sees his own reflection. He's a growing man with concerned expression. Does he wonder about the world? He wonders about the world. Laughing at his frown, he plunges into the water. Chilled and thrilled, he sings. Hola, hola, hola. For this day, oh earth, oh man, may we move together in a peaceful way, peaceful way. Our dear Fred stands atop the mountain, his clear, bright eyes filled with daylight. See the wonders of the world and all its glories unfurled. But there he sees the work of man, Mother Earth upheaved and torn away with a careless hand. Do we hear the spirit of the land stretching his arms wide to the sky? From his heart he sends this prayer. Hola, 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 from the land and sky I pray. Oh earth, oh man, may we move together in a peaceful way. Will we move together in a peaceful way? We in a peaceful way, peaceful way. Thank you. Shirts look real nice.
a problem like this? Can we talk? Well, I don't. I think we're we're getting things set. I, I was going to grab you some water. You want water Well, I don't. I want water. Quiet. Start. Who are you going to be talking about? Who knows? You never know. Just going to be talking. We're just going to talk. It's what we do. Okay. You guys are taking the good stuff away. Yeah. No more music. Well, no. We already performed. Oh, did you? And then we let one other guy use our music for performances. Damn nice of you. Well, I thought we'd be damn nice. You guys did a good job. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen the tape yet. Well, you've got to you've got to expect yourself to have done a good job. Actually, you've I seen yourself perform before. No, actually, I haven't. But um, well, actually, yeah, I have. No. Um, but no. not with not with him. And um, besides that, I know that we sounded much better yes, at Connie's the other night than we did here. I can't believe Connie's is doing live music now. Uh, I think that's great. Well, they, they, they totally changed the whole. You guys, let's yes. put you over here, and then we'll get the benefit yeah. of this without the actual yeah, backlight. Exactly. Sure. Aww. But we're in shadows. We look best with as little as showing as possible. We look the best with like deep, deep backlighting. Deep backlighting is good for the beer talk people. The beer talk people. Yeah. The beer talk people. Is what that what do. this is? The beer talk people? This yeah. is beer talk. And welcome to it. Now we have artwork. You want to sit with? Okay. Yeah. Oh, over here. Will this work? I don't know about the mic for that. Yeah, that'd be better. Um, How about the mic? Because we don't have a mic at all over here. Once they get rid of that. Um, Back up. Yeah, you just push yourself over there. It looks really good. Huh? Well, that should be kind of nice because the mic's right over me, so I won't hear that at all. It's not supposed to be. <laughs> We're sorry about the neon shirts. I'm sure that's going to really make everyone happy. Don't get over it. I used to. Oh, oh, it's a collision. Oh, I didn't before. Step on her toe. You get did. some pictures of. I'm a fan. I have to get some pictures from my. Phone. You're another one that needs to get a life. <laughs> I just keep telling people that. Oh, she's got our, be our good side. They keep saying, I watch your show, I love it. Get a life. <laughs> There's more out there than beer yeah, talk. Here, take this. Well, didn't you guys go to like, some convention thing or something? Well, well, we're going. We were invited to one in, in uh, New in Orleans. New Orleans. We're going to one in Portland. It's a little more logistically We had possible. to decline in, in New Orleans. Yeah. It was just yeah. impossible. Are you world yeah, famous sorry. now? Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Canada and the United States, what else we were, is there? We were just, uh, yeah, really. We were just down at the Microbrew Festival, and, and uh, a bunch of people recognized us down there. And in fact, a few people who were brewers were like, oh, you guys do that beer show. I just read about you in, you know, such and such a trade publication. And so, well, you know. So we're having a great time. So where's our beer? No. You can have the There's lots of extra. <laughs> we, we, typically, we only drink about three or four ounces. My goodness, are we moderate beer. consumers? Yes. Any, everything in moderation. Should I be... Well, as far as I know, we're still kind of waiting. If they can't get me, to get to who cares? cares? If you guys can shove that whole piece of Move everything over. over. Oh. If we can, is this on wheels? Yeah. Even if it's not. For a living. Perfect. Look. Look at that. The mic's right in the middle. I like this. I, I saw them painting these two earlier this morning. So they're not dry yet? Well, I don't know. I don't know how fast drying their paint is. They were about two hours ago. Uh, were they? Paint on my fingers. Uh oh. Uh -huh. Blisters on my fingers. So, uh, well, I, I guess we can just start and assume as well. that we're being picked up and stuff. This is pretty much no, the same. No, we are not we... escapees from a mental institution. Oh, yeah. Although we're still wearing our little bracelets. <laughs> Earlier today, if this is live, which it is for us, but I don't know for you people out there, no, there's a microbrew festival, but they'll rebroadcast it. In 1997, they'll be showing this. Tough rocks. People will probably be award-winning stuff by then. Anybody that watches our show probably needs to get out anyway, so if they're watching this at this point in they time... They should have been out there. Yeah. Have, and we had a hard act to follow as the we song by the split ends goes. I think that yeah. we're going to have to pump up our energy levels. I don't think it's possible. That was, that was wonderful. Well, we don't have the amplification. It's just not fair. We I don't say. have the enthusiasm. We, we don't have the joie de vivre. We vision. don't have talent. Yeah. That's what we're missing. That's, <laughs> That's what's the missing point. from our That's the part. Oh, we can't sing. Goodness. We don't dance, and I can't play the drums. I try to sing pretty often. Yeah, that's when we lose viewers. Know, it's a horrible thing. Got, hey, got our camera people are talking to us. Daryl, everyone's talking to us. We should be listening too. We no, pick up valuable pointers to get us through life. No. 
But, At least they turned off the jaundice light. Yeah. And that thing came on. I was in like, addition, oh, God, just what I need is more green skin. Hmm. Yeah, you're kind of like a amphibious person today. Well, like a mini series about you, Man from Atlantis. Oh, they already did it. The yeah, Dallas they did a whole, guy was they did on a whole that. series on that. Uh, but we're here to talk about things in addition to our usual pablum about beer and brewing and stuff. Because this week, what are we talking about? This is this is talk against, against the, the no, this, songs and poetry, and this is beer talk against the well, end. Well, actually, officially, it just says talk against the end. Okay, well, that's what we do. We talk that's a lot. We, and then we, we wet our whiskles. Talk about but earlier anything. today, we were out at the Microbrew Festival at Karis Park, and what I noticed were well, what I noticed was about five or six hundred people under this big tent with happy looks on their faces, looks of contentment, being just happy to be out there under a tent keeping them from say, the rain. Yeah, of course, they were hammered. No, they weren't. <laughs> That's the point of it all. A lot of people, I think, have problems with people talking about drinking and alcohol, and I think a lot of people would say, well, sure, they're enjoying the world. They aren't part of it. They're flying around up in the heavens above because awesome. they are drinking alcohol. But it's not true. We can enjoy life without this substance, really. It's not like one of those Alcoholics Anonymous people who are saying, I don't really have a problem. Actually, the problem isn't beer, per se. The problem is the dogs. I could enjoy life tremendously without, without, the, dogs. without the, the burden of the dogs. They're like a weight around your neck. They're your albatross. They are my albatross to bear. Rather than a white albatross, you have a black Labrador. I have a black Labrador. Much heavier than the heaviest of albatrosses. 87 pounds. She drags me down. It's just right there. But that was safe. <laughs> well, you're in a bad way. St. Bernard's. Well, See, but so they carry Saint, brandies around their necks. Your St. Bernard probably weighs more than my husky and, and lab together. Well, what can I say? But I think Go ahead the, on your diatribe. Well, I had, I had a really wonderful diatribe actually at the Microbrew Festival, but it's on tape and we can't be on tape because we're live. No, go ahead, walk through. Walk right through. Who cares? We have Here's dogs. our roadie. Here's our roadie, Ben. <laughs> We like the tank. <laughs> Here's two of you. <laughs> Todd, Todd, our cameraman, is wandering around the facility someplace. We, He's in we, a maze. We rarely, travel anywhere, we rarely travel anywhere without him, so we brought Todd with us. Actually, I think he's just simply waiting for the ride home that I'm going to give him when this is over. He's got it going. i got to go home. I think he's hungry. We worked up until 4. And then and we went then to, the, to the microbrew festival from 4 until 7.45. had a couple little thingies. From oh, Lisa, no, the little Mexican oh, those mini things. Yeah, Lisa from the uh, from Casa Pablos gave us a bunch of food. Which so that's nice good. It's nice to have contacts in this town. It's nice that's to have, another, you know. It's nice to have contacts. I think in the, the, the biggest problem with what we are seeing doing, I, I'm not saying people have a problem with us. I'm saying we have a problem with this. I think the biggest problem is him. This, the two of us. There's two of us. We should be showing us like in a group, a whole bunch of people, just having a great old time. But we don't have friends. So yeah. how can we do that? <laughs> we, yeah, it's tough. When you've got, when you've got no friends, when your friends are a Siberian Husky in a black lab, and Todd, the cameraman, standing behind the yeah. camera saying, it's, it's when are you people going to pay me? Much difficulty. <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't pay. We don't pay well, we just don't pay. Once in a while, we get free t-shirts. Yeah, we got these. Uh, I've got my eye backwards, so you can see the front and back. Not that we're advertising for this or anything, because they aren't available anywhere, but we thought... Yeah, I mean, you, it's not you like you can go buy these, because the microbrew festival ends in 10 minutes, so... Yeah. You have to rush on down, they're sold out anyway. For the most part, they're but sold I out. But I think that... You know, we don't try to get happy by drinking beer. It's not like we leave these miserable lifestyle. We're not like Dostoevsky is there. I, I, I We're just writing, life. scribbling frantically in our little notebooks, I, I and we don't do any. <laughs> we don't do anything. What are you kidding? Then we have a beer or two. We're happy. No, that's not no. the case. But I think that it's important that everyone should have something that He's they are. He's sitting on a fizzy. I am. I'm happy. I'm usually, excited. He's not usually this exuberant. After that, we just followed drums and singing and we're sitting there kind of slack jaw going huh we're on after this well you know we're we're supposed to do it so i'm being excited i'm being upbeat and i'm being interrupted go ahead of course sorry. if i was interrupted i'd go on for an hour and a half it'd be horrible <laughs> awful yeah uh, but we don't sit there scribbling being all morose moribund people and then we say oh let's pound 12 beers and get excited no I read a lot of poems. I, th I think that everyone <laughs> should have something they get enthused about, something that makes their life better. I read a lot of poems. That's it. And you like get guillotined at night, and you wake up, and your Zoe dog barks at you, and I, you try I to wake go up. Back. I wake up, and there's a black lab taking up three quarters of my bed. I'm curled up in the fetal position, not by choice, but because there's a black lab taking up 
everything from two thirds of the bed down. Poe had a lot of black cats. I don't remember having an evil black cat. Wow. You read Hound of the Basker. I'm almost. allergic to cats. Mm. Me so. too. Are you? Yes. Seriously. Yes. So many, but so few people are actually allergic to cats. Hi, cats people aren't really cats. bad things. No, 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 no. Cats are a wonderful thing. I mean, my husky is every bit a cat. He acts like a cat. He, he eats oh, like he a cat. He's independent like a cat. If he were able to get out of the yard, he would disappear for weeks. He catches on birds end. and tries to eat them. He catches birds. He catches bulls. Yes. But so few people are actually allergic to cats. Everybody just kind of assumes if you're allergic yeah. to them, you're saying, "I hate cats." That's true. I don't hate. Oh, do you? Yeah. See, I don't really hate cats. <laughs> because we're right I'm just allergic to them, and I hate going to the hospital. Live. Live. So I, I was in the hospital. Were you ever in the hospital? Oh, you moved yeah. Too. Once. Ooh. That way. I'd hate to be allergic to anything. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, there's something like if it was perhaps onions, that's that'd be wonderful. Because he's not allergic to anything. That must be it. Could oh, be. That it could be. <laughs> it helps a lot. Can you imagine being allergic to beer? Oh. Well, you know, it'd be a horrible thing. I was. Oh. Early on, I was allergic to yeast. But you broke that bad. I was like, <laughs> look, this ain't ah. gonna float. We're gonna get over this one. The cat thing, eh, no big deal. Yeast, bad. Bad yeast. Because bad. pizza, that leaves pizza, bread, oh yeah, everything. and beer. Ooh. Everything is out. It? I don't know. Psychosomatic. Because who would mass quantities? Well, I've, I've, a good friend of mine is a, is a vet back in Michigan. He was, he was allergic to cows. And he said the way he got over that was he literally walked up to him and hugged him. Because he wanted to be a vet. And he just over, I mean, he just kept exposing himself over and over and over again. So you drank like, a lot of beer? Well, no, not, not when I was young. <laughs> I had a lot of bread. <laughs> you know, before I thought I got allergic from overexposure. Mm -mm. I don't think so. Could be. Well, maybe yeah. did. Some people aren't allergic to things for a long time, and then all of a sudden they become well, that's, allergic. That's the way bee sting things work, is people say, oh, I'm really allergic to bees. It's like, what, did you die once and you know this? I've always wondered about that. But. Oh, well. Go ahead. But you should have passion about something, and if it's something <laughs> like beer, oh, well. But you know how it is? <laughs> if there's anything in life that you really are interested in, you can build a life around it. True if you're interested in that? collecting stamps, you, know silly you can get so much. much backwards. <laughs> I'm Father Bondo. I had a white shirt on underneath this for earlier and had a big high collar. I was going to uh, be the priestly thing. Yeah, well. well, I'm sorry. I just thought it would be kind of a cool idea that they could see both sides at once. Rogue. Somebody, oh, oh, I was going to really piss him off. Okay, here's my challenge to you. There were 19 breweries there. There are 18 breweries on the shirt. Who's missing? Ooh, That'll bug challenge. him for a while. There we go. Okay, you should have passion about something in your life. If it's stamp collecting, you can learn about each stamp. You can say, well, geez, this Liberian stamp of 1972 has George Washington on it. Why oh, that was easy. Liberians carry a The one from Texas. No, it's here. No, it's not. It's two. Where? Is so? Uh, You're a weenie. Oh, it is. Never mind. I'm right a weenie. Sell us. I'm a weenie. Okay. okay. Belgians, a Belgian time. dude from, uh, well, from Belgium, <laughs> moved to Texas and started brewing there. So, Melikin's <laughs> Pyramid Road, Big Rock. <laughs> but have passion about something. With beer, it's wonderful because there's beer brewed all over the place. There's lots of different styles. You can go into sociological studies of people who overconsume and why they do it. Well, people, there are mil you can home brew yourself. People, people, if somebody really gets passionate about beer, they can they can start to look up the background of beer. I mean, they, or can, they can go like back. Fill bathtubs with beer and just lay down in it and immerse themselves He's in the being subject. goofy. No, they can go back to like Mesopotamia, one of the earliest known recipes in deep, deep, the underneath the earliest recipe ever found. The earliest recipe found, deep underneath the pyramid or, or some such thing in Egypt. They crawled through, you know, spiders. I mean, it was typical <coughs> temple of doom stuff. They crawled through all this stuff. They made it to the bottom of this this shaft, opened up into a room, lit a candle or whatever it was that they lit, and basically this room about a quarter of and the size. And there was Spice McKenzie waiting for him. No, yeah, really, was, no, there were no wait, dogs. Wait, what's the end? What's the end? About a quarter of the of this size, the room was filled with nothing but hieroglyphics that explained how they brew beer. Oh, come on. Seriously. No, that's serious. Beer brewing the was the basis the of civilization. Damn it. Oh. We tell you these things. We keep telling people that. Have they like, tried to do this? Repeat the recipe? Yeah, actually they did. They rebrewed, in fact, uh, Anchor, oh, that's right. Anchor, Anchor Brewery in Anchor. San Francisco um, rebrewed. Oh, no, not, not Osiris. Uh, ooh, the, the beer goddess. Uh-oh. Uh We're it? in big trouble with the beer it's goddess. I can't remember her name. It's not yeah, Osiris. I was, that was my next question. Who, was what? it a beer or a mead? It, it was, was a beer. It was a beer. It was yeah, beer exactly was before beer. mead. What's the difference of, between mead and mead? Mead is honey. brewed with honey. Honey and water. Throw some yeast in it, let it sit for about a year. 
We've never been able to let it sit for a year. Yeah, we, we let it sit for about six, <laughs> six, six weeks or so. It's like, oh, it's the max. It's six six pretty much the max. It's like, we're sitting down in the basement one day going, wow, that looks good. Ooh. And then from that point on, it's just you're grabbing a five gallon jug and you're going, okay, have a glass. And it's, it's a little harsh. But, yeah. but almost every civilization out there, I mean, the uh, especially the South American Indians did a lot of corn based, and then yeah. uh, a lot of the North American Indians did cactus based. You know, they ferment something or another. Every every civilization it's usually is a really religious something. thing. A lot of a lot whether of or not they've used it for relig religious ceremonies or social gatherings or whatever the case may be, every culture has civilized or every civilized culture has <laughs> brewed something. And that's, a lot of people are saying that that's one of the reasons that man settled down. They stopped doing the nomadic life. They said, okay, there's a lot of grain. There's a lot of grain right here. They drank beer, they lost all their energy. You know, they got all lethargic. They like got on the bar stool. They laid around and all of a sudden it's, it's late September and they're going, oh, we better build something to sleep in. So, I mean, they, they settled down and they said, there's a lot of barley here. There's a lot of this grain stuff. Let's let it sit with this water and do what it does. And then a couple of weeks later we drink it and it feels that's good. Right. You can make bread and brew beer. It's, that's what people lived off of for a long time. That's so as far as I'm concerned, Missoula is where it is right now strictly because somebody Three or four thousand years ago, or maybe eight or nine thousand years ago, learned how to brew beer. From beer forward, now we have Apple computers. <laughs> you know, yeah, I wonder who knew where it would lead. I'm sure that, that this this will get calls. <laughs> um, but we have to say goodbye to Cheers. I think Cheers did more for beer drinkers than just about anything in a long time, although their beer drinkers are kind of sedentary. But I mean, that's one of those things that's so hard to believe in this, this culture that is leaning more and more towards prohibitionism. Cheers went for what? Eight, nine years? 11 10 years? years? 11? Okay, it was 11 years. 11 years a show. Clean your messes. I saw the sign. Clean up after yourself. I want to see you with a mop. Not if I spill it on you. I don't have to. I'm directing after this segment, so I want you all to pay particular attention to the technical work from this point forward. I suspect we'll probably get a nice shot of Brad be, cleaning up your It's going to be so crisp. Yes, crisp. I think that's the word we're looking for. Crisp direction. It's going to be so It'll be okay, Kara. People do whatever you want. What are these buttons for? Okay. Oh, it's like a, it's like being behind the controls of a jet. I do feel like I just buttons escaped everywhere. from something. Yeah, I know. I love these. I, I can't get out of them. I'm not real fond of it. I got out of it. It wasn't that difficult. <laughs> what are those? What is well, we were, we were at the, the microbrew festival ah. in Karis Park. One of the things that they, they made you do is you, you paid you paid $3. Commit you to a hospital? Pardon? Yeah. Commit you to a hospital? Well, what, that's what, yeah. Warm oh. Springs. See, what we have to do is first we, we were there drinking a lot the of The police beers. will be back soon. Then us. we have to get in the, little, the cute little white trucks and they take us to Warm Springs for a week of deprogramming. It's a nice place. Yeah. Well, they need a Warm Springs for a reason. I'm sure it's going to be I'm you sure know? it's going to be nice. You just go back they to the told little us all about the big cells. Yeah. And they, they said it's going to be great. Natural pools there and you know in December you can stay warm. It's great. I mean, unfortunately they're right across the street from the world's number one super fun site, but you know, as long as the never the twain No, but really me. that radiation is good for us. It's good for us. It'll heal us. We're getting mistake. better. We're, We're making drank. great progress, Brad. We really. drank a beer last night from Kiev, Russia. And oh, about, Chernobyl. Yeah. About midway through this, we're thinking, wait a minute. Isn't Kiev one of those places that's highly irradiated right now? Isn't that one of those places that it's like... All the Chernobyl Kiev jokes. Is <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I'm sure, you know, you're not going to... We're probably way overexposing any <laughs> film. We're, we're, we're our own right special now. effects. It's you really... Can't focus I'm not, on not going to... Yeah, you probably can't. I'm not going to use my camera for a while just because, you know, cameras will hold that radiation. But... In order to do a, a few moments of a regular beer talk, what are we drinking today, Brad? Black Dog. Where's the bottle? Where'd it go? It's behind you. What's it doing back there? This is Black Dog Porter from our friends at Spanish Peaks and Bozeman. Mark yeah. Travernati. Was he? He wasn't there at the thing today. Was no. Huh. You'd think you could make a little road trip to Missoula. This is, uh, why? Why would he? I don't know. I, He's got stuff going on over on that end of the But state. you see how swamped? There were a couple of the actual head brewers from the breweries there, and they were just swamped. Everyone well, just, Steve. Oh, how do you brew this? How long have you been brewing? Steve it's like, Shellhard. From, it's oh, a great oh, way. I mean, it's a great way to meet people. Should I do to them what I do to Tom? Be your own, own brewmaster. <laughs> good luck. Good luck. No, I won't. <laughs> but yeah, this has a picture of Zoe, our dog. Yep. My dog. Oh, Brad's dog. 
You don't like my dog. Yeah, she sleeps on my bed and drools. Ugh. She has this your dog. Right. Well, it's not really, but I, I have a black lab that... Were, were you done? Okay. I have a black <laughs> lab that she usually sleeps on my bed, but when she's got these horrible hooves and things that she chews that are really smelly, she won't chew them on my bed, she takes them into his room. <laughs> so it's like, Bondo comes up from the basement, goes to bed about 11 o'clock at night, and Zoe's sprawled out on his bed chewing this horrible... With a big puddle of stuff. Right between her mouth and the rawhide thing. Doesn't do it on my bed. No, he's trained her. It's yep. awful. He gives her treats the next morning. Yep. I'm like, Zoe, go irritate Bondo. That's what you're here for. Uh, but uh, as far as this black dog, which is a much nicer black dog than yours, I might add. Pshaw. It's not bad stuff. Uh, <coughs> what what styles? <laughs> wow, Brad's going to have a lot to clean up. He has to clean up his mess. <laughs> I'm the director. Brad, oh, no. Brad has it's, to clean up a lot of things. I don't think directors have immunity. It's, oh, oh I think he's going to try to. Oh, man. He's going to try to. When, I have a question. When did, when did we get the... Uh, here, I'll just pour it's, 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 let, let go. Let go. Don't you. spill on the art. <laughs> that would probably be a bad thing. Unless you want to buy it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you spilled on it, you bought the, it. Um, when did we get a gray diorama? Gray yeah, diorama. We, we saw this other day and thought this wasn't really here. It was always down here. Because oh, we clicked this on last night, and Bondo's saying, no, that's not MCAT. They don't have a, a what was it, taupe or beige or whatever oh, it was. Oh, we have colored lights. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't even think about that. <coughs> Look, <laughs> he's got a puddle underneath I, I do. Well, gentlemen, I hate Should, to, to ask To you break up a good thing? No, we have to stop, because it's time for a play. So, <laughs> beer talk, I mean, this can wait. Yeah, we were supposed to be on at 7.30 in the morning. Oh, wouldn't that have been fun? <laughs> but <laughs> we were. But we got to be on a little later in the evening. So, so that, that they could do the art. It would, yeah. have been, it would have been coffee talk. Yeah, 7.30 been, in the morning, yeah, I'd have been, been, been coffee. talking espresso. It would have been toast talk. Yeah. Yeah. But we're off. I'm off to be a director. Okay. And we'll see you next week. All right. On Beer Talk. Yay. 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 All right. Yay. we got to clean that up. And we got to open this thing up for the... Oops. Do we have a mop? Grab it. Feel free, seriously. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we always share with our crew. Wait a minute. The crew is right here. <laughs> we'll buy the crew something later.
Looks like they're both on. Everything's on. Are you on? Yeah. Okay. Um, just it, it is, it's traditional now since this is our third year to end with a comedy, with a play, a reading of a comedy. And so um, this year we're reading the importance of being earnest. Tonight. I don't know. Well, we maybe should get some more chairs too, so people can. I'll be there. How about like a lounge? Chair. Yes, I can't lounge. I don't think Lady Brackman would lounge. She's not a lounger. She's not. <laughs> A little bit of tight. <laughs> I think she lounges at work. I think she lounges in the private. I think she lounges in the It must be close to you. Let's put this wig back there. In case somebody wants to become active. Our character and, and our name, and if you don't know it, we'll tell you. That's okay. <laughs> I'm Cindy. Cindy, Cindy Taylor. Taylor. Student yeah. stage director. Right. We can help. Yeah. You're going to help me stage director? And you have to kind of speak yeah. at where you can hear and your voice kind of. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, no, I mean like, at higher where, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're at about here. Is that? Um, Does that sound good? Everyone in the sound even, room? Maybe even louder. more. Maybe. Push it, little push it a little bit. Little little bit the audio little. people will like us better. Okay. Just have to. Oh, overdue. Yeah. <laughs> Speak yeah. Tracy, they're doing a sound check. Now. I mean, they're doing a sound check now, everyone. All a right. sound check. A sound <laughs> check. How does this sound? <coughs> you want a little bit oh. more? Oh my goodness! <laughs> yes. Yeah, so now we must all over we out. All. Oh, yes. My Mellow Melodrama. Our narrator. Yeah. A narrator? Do you like that quite yet? <laughs> Our narrator is Cindy Taylor. Cindy Taylor. <clears throat> and here as Jack, we have Joel Baird, Lady Bracknell. Everybody point. Tracy Stone Manning. Tracy Stone Manning. Okay, next. Who? Dr. Chausable will be read by, I don't know your last name. Selmanson. What's your first name? <laughs> We've never seen each other before. No. And we have Jeff. Oh, wait, we all have to point at him. Merriman. And Lane. And Lane. And Lane. And Lane. All the butlers. Okay. No, Cecily. Cecily. Cecily will, will be played this evening by Renata. <laughs> Algie. By Siva. Video. <laughs> and our own dear. <laughs> Wendelin, played by Tammy Rose. Yeah. And? 
Oh no, you! Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 sharp prism. It's made by Tracy Pratt. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Can you close the door? Please. <clears throat> <clears throat> Morning room Wait and Wait a second. Could the camera people <laughs> never say anything ever? So, director, they can't talk to you. Sorry. Go ahead. That was the rehearsal for me, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> First act, scene. Morning room in Algie's flat in Half Moon Street. The room is luxuriously and artistically furnished. The sound of a piano is heard in the adjoining room. <laughs> Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. <laughs> and speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Brackman? Yes, sir. Mm. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shoreman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants in invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute to the to the superior quality of the wine, sir, I've often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first rate. Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. Mm. I've only had a little bit of experience of it myself up to the present. I've only been married once. That was in consequence, in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself a young person. I don't know that I am much interested in your family life, Lane. <laughs> no, sir. It's not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I am sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't see, set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. How are you, my dear Ernest? And what brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Algie. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people as excessively Boring. And who are the other people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, <coughs> neighbors. I got nice neighbors in your part of Sh Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. <laughs> I never speak to any of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Shropshire? Yes, of course. Hello, why all these cups and these cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. Oh, how perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn, and I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you had come up for pleasure. I call that business. Oh, how utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why, one may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get, unmar if I ever get married, I certainly will try to forget it. <laughs> I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Please, Aunt, uh, 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 Ernest, uh, don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. Well, you've been eating them all the time. That is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. 
Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Well, very good bread and butter it is, too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were going to eat at all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. Oh, that's utter nonsense. It isn't. It's a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, algae by Cecily? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. <laughs> Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left uh, uh, in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say that you have my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you'd let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly going to offer a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. <laughs> oh, there's no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. I think that rather mean of you, Ernest. I must say. Oh. <laughs> However, it makes no matter for now that I look at the inscription on the inside. I find that this thing is not yours after all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what's written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard, fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half our modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this <coughs> isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you say you didn't know anyone of that name. No, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is too. Lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algy. Uh, but why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? from little Cecily with her fondest love. Oh, my dear fellow, what on earth is that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. <laughs> that is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. <laughs> you seem to think every aunt should be just like your aunt. That's absurd. Now give me back my cigarette case. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an ant being a small ant. But why an ant, no matter what her size, maybe uh, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name were Ernest. You are the most earnest-looking person I ever saw in my life. It is perfectly absurd you are saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthy, before the Albany. I'll keep this as proof that your name is Ernest if ever you attempt to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town, and... Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small aunt Cecily, who <laughs> lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls her dear, calls you her dear uncle. Come on, old boy, you had much better have the thing out at once. My dear Algy, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist, and it's a very vulgar thing to talk as if you were a dentist when one isn't a dentist, produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists do. Now go on, tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I am quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? What on earth do you mean by a Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now produce your explanation, and pray, make it improbable. My dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me, in his will, guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. 
Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from motives of respect, which you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is this place in the country, by the way? Oh, that is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have bunburied all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? Oh, my dear Algy, I don't know whether you'll be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in a position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or happiness, in order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrape. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. Well, that wouldn't be a bad thing at all. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to people who haven't been to at a university. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as, as you like. I have invented an invaluable and permanent invalid called Bunbury in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I have really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. But I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It is very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. Well, then you had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I have the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dined, with her, I dined there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I am always treated as a member of the family and sent down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormous, enormous, enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simple. It is simply washing yes. one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you are a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunbury. I want to tell you the rules. I am not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It's rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr. your invalid friend, who has the absurd name. Oh, nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic. You will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she's the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly don't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, a three is company and two is none. That, my dear friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about it. The sound of an electric bell is heard. Well, <laughs> that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. <laughs> now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? Oh, I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It is so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. 
Good afternoon, dear Algen, and I hope you're behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? Oh, oh, you're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. <laughs> oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. I'm sorry if we're a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and some of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens, Lane. Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumber? No, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers, not even for ready money. Oh, it really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its color. From what cause, of course, I cannot say. I have quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. Thank you. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She's such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. <laughs> I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight after all. Oh, I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. But fortunately, he's accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me, but the fact is that I have had a telegram to say that my poor dear friend Bunbury is very ill again. Uh, they seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high time that Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of this modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury, from me, to be kind enough not to have a relapse this Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of season, when everyone has practically said what they've ever had to say, which, in most cases, was probably not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen, and if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out. If you will kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. It's very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program will be delightful after a few expurgations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed, I believe is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me? Certainly, Mama. Lady Bracknell and Algy go into the music room. Gwendolyn remains behind. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Oh, pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. Uh -huh. And that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, <laughs> ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. Yes, I am quite well aware of that. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. 
For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. Oh, yes, yes, I know it is. But supposing it was something else, do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Oh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculation, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. I, I don't really think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really? <laughs> Gwendolyn, I must say, I think there are a lot of other nicer names. <clears throat> I think of Jack, for instance, as a charming name. <laughs> Jack! <laughs> <laughs> no, there is very little music in the name of Jack. If any, at all, indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. <coughs> I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man named John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. No, no. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. Uh, I, I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing. Well, surely. I, you, you know that I love you, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not, not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you. But you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched upon. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible dis disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it is only fair to tell you, quite frankly, beforehand, that I am fully determined to accept you. Go on, Berlin. Yes, Mr. Worthing. What have you got to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Oh, of course I will, darling. How long you have been about it. I'm afraid you have had very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I've never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, but you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be. It is hardly a thing that she should be allowed to arrange for herself. And now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I make these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below, in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn? Gwendolyn, the carriage. <laughs> yes, Mama. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer lying here. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I do smoke. I am glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. <laughs> there are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Brack. Oh, I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tempers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. Oh, the whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would probably prove a serious danger to the upper classes, and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. But between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 <laughs> acres, I believe. But I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people that make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Uh, well, I guess that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope? A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, uh, nowadays, that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or, or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm, I'm a libertarian. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us, or come in the evening at any rate. <laughs> now, to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. Fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I'd lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Curdu, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag. A somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred, in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what unfortunate movement that led to? As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station 
might serve to conceal a social indiscretion has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now. But it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. May I ask you then what you'd advise me to do? I need hardly say that I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire <laughs> some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. <laughs> it is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Me, Bradford. sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. La, 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 oh, for God's la, sake, don't la, play la, that la, ghastly la, tune, la, Algie. How la, idiotic la, you la. are. Uh, did it go off all right, old boy? <laughs> you don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you. I... I I know it is a way she has. She is always refusing people. I think it's most ill-natured of her. Oh, Gwendolyn is as bright as a rivet. As far <laughs> as she's concerned, we're engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. <laughs> Never met such a gorgon. <laughs> I don't even know what a gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she's a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only <laughs> thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest <laughs> instinct about when to die. <laughs> that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. That is exactly what things were originally made for. Oh, upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. <laughs> well, you don't think there's any chance of Gwendolyn being like her mother is? Yes? In about 150 years, do you, Algie? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever? It's perfectly phrased. And quite as true as any observation in civilized life should be. I am sick to death of cleverness. Everybody's clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The things become an absolute public nuisance. <laughs> I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. Should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools. Oh, about the clever people, of course. <laughs> oh, what fools. <laughs> By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about you being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? Oh, my dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. <laughs> what extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty and to someone else if she is plain. Oh, that is nonsense. Oh, uh, what about your brother? Uh, what about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy, don't they? Quite suddenly. Yes, yes. But it is hereditary, my dear fellow. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say uh, a severe chill. Hmm. You're sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of the kind? Of course it isn't. Hmm. Very well, then. My poor brother Ernest carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said that uh, Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother, Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a great deal? Oh, that is all right. Cecily's not a silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She's got a capital appetite, goes on long walks, and pays a, no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. Oh, and I'll take very good care you never do. She's excessively pretty, and she's only 18. Have you told Gwendolyn that you have an excessively pretty ward who is just only 18? Oh, one doesn't blurt these things out to people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything that within a half hour they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. And women only do that when they have called each other a lot of other things first. <laughs> now, my dear boy, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and dress. Uh, do you know it's nearly seven? Oh, it's always nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you were it. What shall we do after dinner? Go to a theater? Oh, no, I loathe listening. Well, then we'll go to the club. Oh, I hate talking. Well, we might try, trot round the Empire at ten. Oh, no, I can't bear looking at things. It's so silly. 
Well, what shall we do? Nothing. It's awfully hard work doing nothing. However, I don't mind hard work if there is no definite object of any kind. Miss Fairfax. <coughs> Gwendolen, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolen, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. <laughs> Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn, the story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address at the Albany, I have. What is your address in the country? Oh, the, uh, the manor house, Woolton, Hertfordshire. Algy, who has been carefully listening, smiles to himself and writes the address on his shirt cuff, then picks up the railway guide. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. My own one. How long do you remain in town? Uh, till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn around now. Uh, thanks, I've turned around already. Yeah. You may also ring the bell. Will you let me see you to your carriage, my own darling? Certainly. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane. I'm going bunberry. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and the bunberry suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you're a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. <laughs> There's a sensible, intellectual girl, the only girl I've ever cared for in my life. <laughs> what on earth are you so amused about? <laughs> oh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that's all. Oh, if you don't take care, your friend Bunbury's going to get you in a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only things that are never serious. Well, that is nonsense, Algy. You never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. And Dr. one, we'll take a little break. <laughs> Even put on some music, maybe. <laughs> We can open the door if people want to smoke, since oh, we have all these that. smokers. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs>